Hello, and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Express check-in. Today I'm recapping Tabletop Bellhop Live, episode 27, Bellhop Board Gaming Birthday Bash. That's a lot of Bs. I am Mo Tuzano, the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, answering your game and game night questions and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. <coughs> tabletop Gaming Weekly, where we look back at the games that are tabletop in the last week. Now, the big thing that happened this week is that I celebrated my birthday in the best way possible with great food, good friends, and lots of good games. So many great games got played during that party that we saved that recap for our main topic this week. Now, I did get in some other games as well. Earlier in the week, my friend Toozy had her birthday party at a great local game store, the CG Realm. It was a mix of gamers and non-gamers, and the first game that got played was one of the gifts she actually opened at the event, which was the Dragon Ball Z version of Yahtzee. Now, I didn't play this game, but I did note that it was just Yahtzee, with some pretty pictures on it, and the dice, pictures on the dice, and a Dragon Ball-style dice roller. Uh, there was nothing special here. I gotta admit, personally, I think it'd be much cooler if these themed versions of Yahtzee's had some special rules that applied to the license, but it didn't seem like that was going on here. Up next, we played a big group game of Monty Python Flux. While I'm not a big fan of the Flux series overall, I do find it's great for mixed groups like this. Plus, what can be easier to teach a new gamer than draw a card, play a card? I did dig the Monty Python theme, and I've got to admit, it does fit in really well with the chaos that is Flux. After Flux, we played one of the games that I brought, and that was Bandu. Uh, this is a stacking wooden bit style game that one of the attendees aptly numbed Reverse Jenga. This was my first play of my personal copy of Bandu, and it went over well. I like the addition of an auction mechanic to determine who places a piece. It's something you don't see often in dexterity games. And I really dig the cutthroat nature of being able to take a hard-to-place piece and pass it on to your opponents and having them have to bid to not take it. Bandu was popular enough with this group that we actually played twice, um, trying out two of the four different variations of play that are in the main box. So far, I gotta admit, I prefer the base game to the one where you're trying to stack higher every time, but both were fun. Up next comes our Friday Night Gloomhaven game, which you can join us for live every Friday at 8.30 p.m. Eastern on our Twitch channel, which can be found at twitch.tv forward slash tabletop bellhop. Now, despite a bit of a rough start due to us writing down the wrong scenario number at the end of the last game, which was totally my fault, I've seen the video evidence, I apologize, my bad, we then went on to tackle scenario 21, the Infernal Throne. Now, if you've been watching, either live or on the edited actual play version right here on YouTube, you know that the last mission, we angered a demon lord who offered us two choices. Go find an artifact or death. We, of course, agreed to go find the artifact, but that's not what we actually did. Instead, we went back to Gloomhaven, geared up, and leveled up. So on Friday's game, we came back to kick some demon butt and managed to do so, but barely. I personally got exhausted earlier in the battle, but not after doing significant damage. I'm a big fan of the rocks fall, you die strategy now. The rest of the group avenged me and managed to win the day. Without spoiling any more than I already have, I will just say that I really liked this mission, and it, the fact that it wasn't just beat up the boss and there was a twist to it. Now, as for my podcast co-host, Sean, he has been on a big card game kick lately, specifically deck builders. Now, this includes playing a ton of Ascension on Steam, and he had a lot of positive things to say about how Steam has handled the user interface for Ascension and all the expansions, doing some really great things with having cards off-screen, but still easy to access. The big thing for Sean, though, last week was trying out the DC Comics deck-building game with his son. This went over extremely well, with his son really liking the semi-co-op nature of the game and the fact that the players don't battle each other, but rather are competing to do a better job of beating up the villains. Now for a more detailed look and discussion of all these games we just mentioned, be sure to check out the full podcast when it goes live Tuesday mornings. I've got two quick announcements this week. We've got a newsletter. Sign up to receive a weekly email in your inbox that recaps all of the content we put out in the week previous. You can subscribe to this newsletter at newsletter.tabletopbellhop.com. 
Now, March 15th to 17th, Sean, Deanna, and I will be at Breakout Con at the Sheridan Centre in downtown Toronto, Ontario. This is a fantastic, smaller, yet growing con that features all forms of analog gaming. RPGs, LARPs, miniatures, and a fantastic board game room with a huge game library. If you're going to be at the con, be sure to stop by and say hi. Though please don't be upset if I don't remember or recognize your name. I am terrible with names. Ask the Bellhop. We're here to answer your gaming and game night questions, normally. But this week, we're taking a break from your questions to recap the ridiculous number of games Sean and I played as part of my birthday bash that happened this past Saturday. Gaming that day started off with a two-player game of Ticket to Ride New York, just between Sean and I. And it's always awesome to actually get the game with Sean in person. Like, he lives in Hamilton, I live in Windsor, and despite being in the podcast together, we are not local to each other anymore. And it was cool to play something just me and him before the main festivities started. Now, Ticket to Ride New York is a smaller micro version of Ticket to Ride, designed specifically for two to four players. You only have 15 destinations, and routes are a maximum of four spots long. Players are playing cabs and other public transit instead of trains. It plays nearly identical to the full game, with one extra scoring round for connecting to special tourist attraction spots on the board. I gotta admit, I was very impressed by this game. It manages to give you that full Ticket to Ride feel in under 15 minutes. Yes, under 15 minutes. Up next, we move to the CG Realm. Now I'm going to take a quick moment to call them out for doing something awesome. The CG Realm is a local game store here in Windsor. Starting this year in January, CG has agreed to donate $1 per person who attends any of their weekend tabletop gaming events, which happen twice a month on the second and fourth Saturday of each month, to our 2019 Extra Life efforts. Huge thank you to CG Realm for doing that. You guys are awesome. So the first game up at the game store was Scoville. This was obviously inspired by our four to six player after dinner game topic last week where this game came up. In Scoville, players are chili pepper farmers who buy, plant, and crossbreed peppers in order to fill market orders and make the hottest chili possible for the chili cook-off. This game was even better than I remembered. It's easy to teach, rather cutthroat, and engaging for all players, even at the max player count. I'm really looking forward to getting it to the table again soon and trying out the Labs expansion, which lets you mix your own peppers not on the main board. Up next, I finally got to sit down and play a game with a fan of the show, Kevin, or Tech2674 from the lobby, our live show chat room. We've met a couple times, but never actually gotten to sit down and play a game together until now. That game was Gizmos. It was myself, Kevin, Kat from our Gloomhaven stream, and Sean. I'm still really digging Gizmos. I'm very glad I got this one for Christmas. It's not one I picked out myself. I got as a gift, and I am really glad to see that despite the number of times I've been playing this in a short period, there doesn't seem to be a dominant strategy, and I don't seem to be dominating by having played it more than other people. Uh, the game went really well. Kevin had a great time. It was great to play with him, and all four of us really enjoyed playing it. After Gizmos, we took a look around the store and noticed everyone was busy playing something else. So we had the four of us still, and we grabbed a four-player game. I gra took this chance to grab Azul, Stained Glass of Sintra. Now, this is my second time teaching and playing the game, and it went so much better the second time. Having played before, I could better explain some of the interactions in the game, and more importantly, how scoring worked. The game itself just played better as people had a better grasp on what they should be doing. This play definitely raised my opinion on Sintra. It's, it's moving up the ladder there. Though I gotta admit, it's still not approaching the love I have for the original Azul. At least not yet. I don't know if it'll get there. After Azul, Stained Glass of Sintra, we mixed up the groups. Everyone kind of moved around. I know a Terraforming Mars got, game got going and a couple other stuff was going. A friend and local gamer, Scott, joined my table and offered to teach Railroad Inc., specifically the Blue Edition. Now, I've been hearing really good things about this roll and write and jumped at the chance to check it out. Railroad Inc. is a transit-based roll and write where four dice are rolled and everyone at the table has to use those dice to fill in a dry erase board with a 7x7 seven seven grid on it. Players are drawing rails and roads trying to build routes of both types of transit systems. Points are scored for connecting exit points, longest road, longest rail, and then points are lost for incomplete routes. It's very quick and easy to teach with a lot of fun decisions. What I really enjoyed the most, though, is that all the players have to use the same dice rolls every time, yet everyone's map at the end looked completely different. 
After the event, I added Railroad Ink, actually both colors, the red and the blue, to my wish list right away. Thank you very much for teaching us that game, Scott. I really dig it. Now, the final game we played at the CG Realm is a true classic, Bonanza. I have the, the bean planting game from Uwe Rosenberg of Agrica and Caverna fame. We had a full table of seven people planting and trading and having a great time. Bonanza has been one of my favorite big group games since it came out in the 90s, and I was really pleased to see that it's still as much fun as it was back then, even if we didn't take the game very seriously at the event. At this point, the store was closing. We headed back to my place for some more games, the first of which was more Bandu. I set up a six-player game just using the original rules, the basic auction rules. Again, I had fun with it. I really dig the pieces, which I guess have actually changed significantly between editions of the game that have come out over the years. The parts in my particular copy, the latest printing, are extremely well made and contain some really interesting shapes. Now this game with a bunch of gamers was way more cutthroat than any previous one I played, and most of the game was all about people passing horrible pieces to the person next to them and making them have to make do with it. It was a lot of fun. Now over in another part of the room, Sean, my wife, and a couple of the other guests set up Valeria Card Kingdoms. Now I noted earlier Sean's been on a card game kick and this just added fuel to that fire. He noted that he really enjoyed the game, but did have a few minor complaints about the final scoring rules with the Dukes, both in regards to the grammar used on the Dukes and the power of at least one of the cards. So that is something to watch for. Now after Bandu, the group I was with split and everyone kind of switched up. I ended up sitting down with three other players, so four total, and I taught a game of Euphoria, Build a Better Dystopia. I taught it badly. Uh, this was another game inspired by last week's four to six player topic. The game came up on the list. I'm like, man, I need to play that again. The problem was that it had been more than a year since I played it, and my memory of the rules was a bit rusty. Now, despite screwing up a bigot at the beginning, and we offered to restart and decided to just push through, we all had a good time. The game is as good as I remember, especially once we started playing with the proper rules. It is a great worker placement and displacement game with a darkly humorous theme that I do highly recommend. The thing is, you've got to learn the game and play it again quickly. It definitely rewards repeated plays. Now over on the other table, Sean's group had moved on from Valeria and were playing some Azul. Multiple rounds of Azul just using the base rules. Now, Azul never fails to disappoint, and I hear these plays were both very social, but also rather cutthroat, especially based on some of the language I heard from the other side of the room. Back at my table, Euphoria was followed by Egizia, one of my favorite games of all time. This is an Egyptian-themed worker placement game with a cool placement mechanic. Each turn, places players place boats onto spots on the Nile. The thing is, your first boat is placed, your next one has to go further down the river. This leads to all kinds of interesting choices. Do you jump ahead to get that big, sweet farm, or do you take it slow, hoping to hit more spots than your opponents? This is probably the biggest hidden gem in my collection. It's a game almost no one's ever heard of, yet one of the best games I own, even if I did come in dead last Saturday. Now, while we were playing Agizia, Sean's group had swapped over to Splendor. This was Sean's first time playing Splendor, Splendor and he really enjoyed it. Enough that they played multiple rounds as it got late into the night. Sean did note that it was a great game for socializing where you could pay partial attention to the game and enjoy your company. For me, I needed something lighter to play. Gizia can be a bit heavy. So I grabbed Gravwell, Escape from the Ninth Dimension. I first got to try this game at Origins 2015 and loved what it did. Something unique. I don't know any other game that uses gravity as its main theme and mechanic. Now this is a quick, almost filler games where players are playing cards to try to get their ships to escape the black hole like Gravwell. The neat part is card play is simultaneous and it's all about timing and making sure you're accounting for the gravity of the ships around you. I still really dig this game. It's easy to teach and has some really neat mechanics. Now after Gravwell, it was running rather late. Most of the guests had headed home. Those of us that were left wanted something light to play and that's when Gizmos came out again. And again, failed to disappoint. Still, very popular game with everyone that played it. Now, Kat played this with us and got the pleasure of beating local gamer guru Charles, which is something of a local badge of honor. Now, we finished up the night exactly where we started. Thing came full circle with a 5 a.m. game of Ticket to Ride New York with Sean, I, local gamer Chris, and Charles, who I just mentioned. Now, I have to admit, I don't remember much about this game. 
Uh, the combination of the late hour, I guess early hour, and the craft beer in my belly made things a bit foggy. I'm told that I was rather pleased with myself for tying Charles in the end. Overall, it was a fantastic birthday celebration. It's not often I can get in nine different games in one day and multiple plays of some of those. While the games were great, it's the people who really made the day special. A big thanks to everyone who came out and game that day. It's appreciated. Thank you very much. For a lot more talk about these games and the event in general, be sure to check out the full podcast episode of Tabletop Bellhop Live here on YouTube or through your favorite podcatcher Tuesday morning. Do you have a gaming or game night question you would like us to tackle in a future Bellhop segment? You can send your questions to questions at tabletopbellhop.com or you can head over to the website tabletopbellhop.com and click on Ask the Bellhop. Remember that we record a new episode of Tabletop Bellhop Live every Wednesday night at 9.30 p.m. Eastern, and we'd love it if you joined us in the lobby, our chat room. The edited podcast version of that show gets released every Tuesday. If you enjoy the content we're providing, please consider tipping the bellhop at patreon.com slash tabletopbellhop. Thank you for joining me for this episode of Tabletop Bellhop Express Check-In. You can always find us across the web and social media as Tabletop Bellhop, one word, or drop by our website at tabletopbellhop.com for more gaming content. Be sure to subscribe to our channel by clicking over here, and check out our latest video by clicking over here. I am Mo Tuzano, the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge. Good night, and game on.